Well, it's a real joy to continue to be with you. I enjoyed uh, my time with you all last night and uh, getting to know you. And I, I didn't notice last night, but I noticed it this morning, the pictures out there of R.C.'s time here. And uh, I don't know, judging by the big smile on his face, I just, I don't think he really enjoyed himself much um, while he was with you folks. <laughs> no, I, you could tell uh, he was happy. And I, it might have something to do with Harry Reader as well and uh, his friend Harry, but I think also uh, what uh, my son who's with me and I, uh, we both uh, picked up on just what uh, not only beautiful facilities you have here, but uh, what uh, just delightful and warm and gracious uh, folks you are. So it's been a joy, and I appreciate your hospitality, uh, southern hospitality. I love it. And now we will go to the text. And uh, that text, of course, is the one where this hymn uh, that we just sang together uh, has for us as a uh, as R.C. would say, not, not just twice repeated, but thrice repeated, uh, our holy God. So to set the stage for us, it is Isaiah chapter 6 and uh, verses uh, 1 to 7. Uh, mentioned this last night, if you were with us, that when R.C. taught homiletics at seminary, he would teach his students to find the drama in the text and then preach the drama. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 7 has drama in every line. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, uh, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The holiness of God. I brought along my well-dog-eared copy. And uh, in the early pages, at uh, pages 14 and 15 of my copy, R.C. is speaking of the holiness of God as the, as the central idea. He says the, the one concept, the central idea I kept meeting in Scripture was the idea that God is holy. Uh, the word was foreign to me. I wasn't sure what it meant. I made the question a matter of diligent and persistent search. Today, and uh, this was originally written in 1984, today and published in 85, today I am still absorbed with the question of the holiness of God. I'm convinced that it is one of the most important ideas that a Christian can ever grapple with. It is basic to our whole understanding of God and of Christianity. The idea of holiness is so central to biblical teaching that it is said of God, holy is His name. His name is holy because He is holy. And as He moves 
uh, to the end of the book. He says this, uh, we are creatures, uh, creatures uh, who prefer life in a cave. And he goes on to say, shadows in a cave are given to change. They dance and flicker with ever-changing shape and brightness. To contemplate the truly holy and to go beyond the surface of creaturely things, beyond the shadows in the cave. We need to get out of our self-made cave and walk in the glorious light of God's holiness. Uh, R.C. saw this as the central idea of Scripture. I saw it as the central idea to who God is and saw it as the central idea of Christianity. What I would like to do with you in our time in this Sunday school is, is answer two questions. Uh, where did this idea come from for R.C.? Uh, how, how did he get there? How did he get to, to writing this book in 1984 and uh, his ministry being known as having at the center of it the proclamation of the holiness of God in all of its fullness? How did he get there? And then the second question, uh, why does it matter? Why does this question of holiness matter? Well, to answer the question of how did he get there, I have six points. I, I normally try to have five points because, after all, we're all Calvinists. But I, but I have six points because I'm actually a six-point Calvinist. And you know what the sixth point is, right? Everyone should be one. That's the sixth point of, of Calvinism. But he got there uh, the first through a reading of Scripture. I mentioned this last evening, if you were with us, just to rehash. R.C. wasn't converted to his freshman year of college. Uh, he'd grown up in a church. It was a Presbyterian church in his community where he lived, Pleasant Hills, bedroom community of Pittsburgh, up on the mountain, exactly 10 miles from the point in that center of the park there at Pittsburgh. And he was in church every week. He was in the choir. He never heard the gospel preached. And as a freshman in college, he came to Christ. And he didn't know what you're supposed to do with the Bible. He thought it was a book. And how do you read a book? You start at page one and you read it all the way through to the end. And so immediately on becoming a Christian, the first thing he did was read the Bible through. And as he read the Bible through, his, his testimony is that he came away from that reading with an overwhelming conclusion that this is a God who plays for keeps. This is a serious God. And to deal with this God is a serious matter, a sobering matter, a somber matter, this God of the Bible. Uh, the first step to getting to, to writing this book in 1985, the first step to getting there was a reading of Scripture. Uh, the second step was a novel. Again, I mentioned this last night. Uh, this is Melville's Moby Dick. Uh, at the college where R.C. went, there was a Melville scholar in the literature department and, and taught American literature. And uh, R.C. had him for an American lit class and fell in love with this novel, uh, what R.C. would maintain throughout his entire life, his favorite novel, uh, Melville's Moby Dick. His uh, love of Moby Dick and his love of philosophy uh, led him to write his, his bachelor's thesis entitled The Existential Implications of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. You know this guy was going to go on to be a philosopher theologian with a title like that. And he loved everything about the book. He loved the drama of the book. He loved the first line of the book, call me Ishmael. And we know well, where do we first meet Ishmael? It's uh, before he's even born. And um, 
Hagar, and, and, and what an interesting chapter, isn't it? And um, there's enough guilt to go around and blame to go around between all three of those characters, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, and the result of that is Hagar flees, and she's in a desert in the wilderness of Shur, suspended between her homeland of Egypt and, and Abraham's encampment. And she's by a well, and God visits her. And we have coming out of that this, this beautiful expression that our God is the God who sees. And that's where we first meet Ishmael in the pages of Scripture. And here's the first line of Melville's novel. Uh, one of the chapters, R.C.'s favorite chapter is The Whiteness of the Whale. Uh, my favorite chapter is Shark Attack. But his was Whiteness of the Whale. And uh, it's this interesting study. If you read Moby Dick, you know that Melville will break from the narrative and, and give uh, excursions on cetology. C-E-T, cetology. And we all know what cetology is. It's the study of whales, cetology. And so in the midst of this dramatic novel, you have these excursions, almost scientific. And so it is with the whiteness of the whale, and it represents pure transcendence, sheer luminosity. Uh, doesn't Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, describe God as dwelling in inaccessible light, overwhelming purity. And this, this whale, the, the main character in one sense of the novel, is the representation of God, a metaphor for God. And here's Ahab, a metaphor for what was quickly emerging in the 19th century, a, a, an almost proto-secularism of, of somehow uh, controlling God and confining God and circumscribing God and therefore conquering God. And so Ahab did it by charting the whale and predicting its movements and knowing precisely where it would be and when it would be most vulnerable. And at that point, he would he would launch his attack, such, such hubris. And it undoes him, and it undoes his crew. And so, R.C. in his thesis writes the line that Ahab represents the shallow religious views of humankind. As if we could somehow lasso the infinite, eternal God and, and bring him down to be on our terms. It was not long after R.C. wrote this book in the early 90s, there was a book published that had a tremendous influence on me. I suspect it had a tremendous influence on you. David Wells' No Place for Truth. And that kicked off a series of books that are just absolutely phenomenal and in their incisive analysis of, of culture and the church and uh, how we as a church and Christians and theologians must respond. And I think it's in A God in the Wasteland. Uh, maybe it's a, another one of the books um, where Wells makes the comment that God rests casually on the shoulders of the American church. And of course, to understand the very term glory is to understand that it is weight kabod, or as the Latin expression would have it, gravitas. But not, not so for Ahab. And as a college student, reading Scripture, reading this novel, R.C. is beginning to piece together this idea of who this God is. Uh, he moves on to his seminary studies, and he encounters a book by a German theologian 
And in that book, he encounters a Latin phrase. So we have a reading of Scripture, number one. We have a novel, number two. And now number three, we have a German theologian and a Latin phrase. A German theologian was Rudolf Otto, and he wrote a book on holiness. And he begins the book by discussing that we uh, tend to think of holiness as moral purity. And that is certainly part of the definition of holiness. But if we stop there, uh, we will never have an understanding of what holiness is. And Otto uh, turns to a medieval Latin phrase uh, to get at the heart of holiness. And that medieval phrase is mysterium tremendum. Now, when I was working on the biography of R.C., one of the things I I did was get his library and work through his library and sort of retrace his steps through the books that influenced him uh, to see where the ideas came from and how the ideas sort of took root and shape and grew. And uh, reading his books were very fascinating. He's an active reader, always pen in hand, multiple pens in hand. And um, sometimes he would underline a passage. Sometimes he would uh, put a margin note and write in the margins. And sometimes he would uh, draw a big sloppy asterisk next to something. And sometimes he would use a highlighter. And there were moments where he would use all four. So I remember sitting with R.C. and I said, I need a key here, uh, Dr. Sproul. Uh, help me understand this. Uh, what's it mean if it's underlined? Oh, that's important. That's an important passage. Uh, what's it mean if there's a margin note? Oh, that's, a, that's a, an important passage. Uh, pay attention to that. Well, what's the asterisk mean? Oh, that, that means it's, it's very important. Pay attention to that. So when I come across something that's underlined and you have a margin note and an asterisk and you highlight it, what does that mean? Oh, those are the really, really, really very important passages that you've got to pay attention to. And, and as you're moving, as Otto is building up to, to, ex, to expressing holiness as the mysterious tremendum, you see all of those things at work. The underlining, the highlighting, the asterisks, the margin notes. And there it is, mysterium tremendum. A mysterium is easy enough to translate, Right? mystery. Uh, there's no mystery there in terms of what the Latin word means. But the Latin word mystery means that a finite mind is capable of going into it, but not all the way into it. A mystery uh, means, as Scripture defines for us, that the things revealed belong to us, but that's not all that is to be known. Because there are secret things, and they're beyond us, and they belong to the Lord. Uh, the truth is, in all doctrine, we can only go so far. Now, we must go as far as Scripture teaches us, and we must, must lean in and, and push in to those doctrines, because we have an obligation to know them and, and study them. But we realize that it every point at doctrine, we are going to bump into mystery. And how much so when we're talking about the doctrine of God? Uh, one of R.C.'s favorite attributes for the doctrine of God is aseity. And it depended on which day of the week it was, whether he pronounced it aseity or aseity. It means that God is not like us. We are contingent beings. We exist based on the previous existence of beings, and we could not exist without other beings. But God is apart from. He is outside of that causal chain of being. He is what the philosophers call a necessary being. Every time 
we get into the doctrine of God, we will eventually bump into mystery. That's mysterium. Now, tremendum is tricky. If you think it means tremendous, like a tremendous mystery, a fantastic mystery, you're wrong. It's not tremendous. As R.C. says in The Holiness of God, you want to understand what tremendous means? Go to the spiritual. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And then the moan. Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. That's the mysterium tremendum. It's not tremendous mystery. It's a mystery that makes us give out at our knees. It's a mystery that causes us to shake like a leaf. It's a mystery that causes us to tremble before the holiness of God. Do not venture into that lightly. Venture into that seriously. The tre mysterium tremendum. Now, what does the uh, Bible teach us? But to fear God. To fear God. Unless we think this is an Old Testament doctrine and we can think differently, as New Testament Christians, let's all go back and read Hebrews 12 together. And let's talk about that mountain. That mountain that you, you can't even touch, let alone ascend. And let's talk about this living God who is a consuming fire, who again dwells an inaccessible light. Mysterium tremendum. So we have a, a reading of Scripture, we have a novel, we have a German theologian in a Latin phrase, and fifthly, we have another Latin phrase. Uh, this comes uh, from the classical tradition. It, it comes uh, from uh, the, the early church fathers, and it, it comes into uh, Thomas Aquinas, and then it comes into the Reformers, and it comes into the uh, post-Reformation uh, scholastics, and then it comes into the Princetonian, Princetonians. It's, it's really there at the beginning of pretty much all of systematic theology in that Reformed classical tradition. And the Latin expression is this, ends perfectissimus. Now, ends is being. Perfectissimus, simple enough, we might be tempted to translate it, perfect being. But that would be wrong. This is really bad English. So if you're young and you're learning grammar, pay no attention to what I'm about to say. The best translation of ends perfectissimus is this. The most perfectest being. That's what it means. Uh, Latin is not troubled by the things in English that we are troubled by. We cannot attach superlatives to superlatives. A perfect is already a superlative. Uh, there's good or there's bad, there's good, there's better, there's best, and then there's perfection. It's the superlative. To call something perfect is the superlative. But as we have endings, ER and EST, to indicate the superlative. So does Latin. But Latin can attach a superlative to a superlative. And so God is not only a perfect being. He is indeed the most perfect being. And so we have not only is God holy, but He is the thrice holy God, holy, 
holy, holy. And then lastly, which leads us to Isaiah 6, is two dramatic encounters in Scripture. Now, we can find uh, the holiness of God across the pages, and we can find the characters in the Bible coming to the holiness of God across the pages of Scripture. But two places stuck out in R.C.'s mind, and one is from 1 Chronicles 13. We don't often refer to First and Second Chronicles when we're talking about doctrine, uh, but this chapter is worthy, and it is the story of Uzzah. And again, we mentioned this last night. And there's the ark teetering as it's being carried and, and tr being transported, and it's about to fall. And as R.C. calls him, well-intentioned Uzzah thinks he's doing God a favor uh, by, by reaching out and, and protecting the ark from falling on the unclean dirt, but forgetting that he is a creature who cannot encounter this holy God, and God strikes him dead. And R.C. goes on to say, what's also interesting about that account is David's reaction. Do you remember David's reaction? When he heard about it, he was angry. And R.C. says, if a theologian the caliber of David is missing it here on what's happening, how susceptible are we to not coming to grips with the pure holiness of God. Uh, Uzzah is there to teach us, to teach us who God is. And this is no light matter. So it's Uzzah, 1 Chronicles 13, and then it's Isaiah in chapter 6. These are not um, chubby little Raphaelite angels that we encounter here, are they? All these, all these artistic images that we have of angels with their curly golden locks and their chubby little arms and their baby little faces adorning the story adorning the frame. Uh, Ray Orland in his commentary on Isaiah 6 says, no, these, these angels are more like fighter jets zooming back and forth and around this throne scene. And then the voice, like, a, like an earthquake, and everything's shaking. And then on top of that, the smoke. This is, this is an incredibly uh, dramatic encounter. And the angel voices with their symphony of praise to who God is. Holy, holy, holy. Uh, like probably most of you, I love the ESV, but I can't help when I get to Isaiah's response to all this to want to slip back to the King James. I get, for I am lost, but I, I think it's much better to say, for I am undone. Uh, R.C. likens it to a tapestry, all, all woven together. And you just, you just pull on the one vulnerable thread. You know, you've done that before. You have a little thread on a tie or you have a little thread on a coat. And you think, oh, I'll just, I'll just pull on that a little bit and get rid of it. And then you realize what a mistake you just made. And, and there it is, that vulnerable thread of Isaiah. And what is that vulnerable thread? Well, he's a, he's a fallen human being. That's the thread. He's... he's He's in Adam. 
He's, he's a man in the presence of a holy God. That's the, that's the, that's the vulnerable thread. And you just put a little tug on it, just a little pull, and the whole thing just is a pile of thread. And Isaiah is undone. R.C. would say, God is holy and man is not. A God is holy and man is sinful. And now there's a third truth. Therefore, we need a substitute. And, and here comes this fighter jet zooming in with the six wings and, and takes a coal from the altar and signifying uh, the necessity of purifying sin to be in the presence of a holy God. And Isaiah is atoned. And so he can not only stand in the presence of God, but he can obey God. And he takes up his commission to be Israel's 11th hour prophet before they are taken into captivity. So it was a, how did he get there? It was a, a reading of scripture. It was a novel, a German theologian in a Latin phrase, another Latin phrase, and then to take him home, it's back to scripture and these dramatic encounters. Um, I mentioned this last night, but Holiness of God, the book was published in 85. R.C. was treating it long before then. He first heard a sermon on Isaiah chapter 6 by John Guest. Have any of you ever heard John Guest on the radio, the British preacher, a suburb of Pittsburgh? R.C. was friends with John Guest, remained friends uh, with John Guest uh, up until uh, his death, R.C.'s death. Uh, R.C. was inspired by that to preach a sermon on the holiness of God and then uh, 1970, he did his first series on it. It was at a Young Life conference in Saranac Lake. Uh, then at the study center, he would teach on it often. And then in 73, 74, when they started doing video cassette teaching series, uh, Holiness of God wasn't the first, it was the third. And he's got these cool uh, aviator sunglasses on. And he is so right out of the 70s. Uh, in front of this fireplace with these circular glass panels and a wooden cross that was made from wood there on the study center campus on the mantle, uh, proclaiming the holiness of God. And then it was published in 1985, and Renewing Your Mind went on the air uh, this 30th anniversary, October 3, uh, 1994. Renewing Your Mind goes on the air, first teaching series, The Holiness of God, first ever uh, broadcast of RC on the radio, Renewing Your Mind, The Otherness of God. Now back to that German theologian and his book. That's the holiness of God. That's where it came from. Why does it matter? Uh, let me read two sections from the holiness uh, book. This is early on again, chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1. He says, how we understand the person and character of God the Father affects every aspect of our lives. It affects far more than what we normally call the religious aspects of our lives. If God is the creator of the entire universe, then it must follow that he is the Lord of the whole universe. No part of this world is outside of his lordship. That means no part of my life must be outside of his lordship. His holy character has something to say about economics, politics, athletics, romance, everything with which we are involved. He then gets us to the end of his book and says similarly, Christianity is not about involvement with religious experience as a tangent it involves a meeting with the holy God who forms the center or the core of human existence. The Christian faith is theocentric, 
God is at the center. Uh, God is not at the edge of Christians' lives, but he's at the very center. God defines our entire life and our worldview. Uh, the answer, in short, is it the holiness of God? Why does it matter? Uh, because everything is at stake. Because everything relates to it. He ended up giving uh, Ligonier Ministries a very interesting mission statement. Uh, your pastor referenced being at R.C.'s funeral in 2017. And uh, there were a number of close friends of R.C.'s and authors and folks he shared platforms with at conferences that uh, came down uh, for the funeral. And uh, the night before the funeral, we all gathered uh, together and we invited a number of these folks just to spend some time just remembering R.C. and, and sharing our stories. And John Piper was there and he um, uh, made the comment, I don't know of any Christian organization's mission statement that has the word holiness in it. And uh, Ligonier Ministries exists to proclaim the holiness of God in all of its fullness to as many people as possible. I mean, talk about an animating mission statement. That's something to get out of bed for every morning. Uh, the holiness of God must be at the center because fundamentally God is at the center. And it strikes me that in our modern world, our contemporary world, we need to remind, of, remind ourselves of this almost on a daily basis because there's so much on the horizon in front of us that we so often forget the vertical. The first word of Augustine's confessions, which is in some sense autobiographical. It's, it's, it's in one sense the first autobiography. There were, there were chronicles written about the king's exploits and histories of their endeavors, but, a, but a, a sort of story that gets under the surface and even looks at the psychology of the person. Well, well that goes to Augustine's Confessions. And in one sense, you could say it's a book about him. You know the first word of Augustine's Confessions? Magnus. Great are you, God. That's where Augustine begins the story of himself. Because it is not the story of Augustine. It is the story of what Augustine will say in his Psalms commentary of God, that he is the hound of heaven. It is the story of the hound of heaven who tracks down Augustine, who much like Adam commits the original sin and goes east of Eden and continues to go east of Eden thinking he, he can outrun God somehow until God brings him back home to himself. And he literally brings Augustine back home to North Africa. It's a beautiful story, Augustine's confession, full of interesting chapters on Platonic philosophy in the middle for bonus. But it's one grand story of God. And Augustine's instincts are, are not to start with himself. His instincts are to start with God. There was a medieval theologian, uh, Anselm of Canterbury, who uh, published uh, not only a wonderful the uh, theological book on uh, the incarnation, Why the God-Man, but he also published a significant philosophy book that gets... Um, is in all the readers uh, of philosophy it gets introduced into uh, introduction to philosophy classes, and it's his book, Proslogion. And it's where he unfolds the ontological, these are big words, ontological argument for the existence of God. You know, the first word of Anselm's book is humuncio. 
Now we're back to Latin, adding not in this time superlatives to words, but diminutives to words. Uh, if you are a Spanish speaker, if you study Spanish, you know Spanish does this. There's uh, perdo, which is the word for dog, but then there is perdo tito, little dog. Uh, that's what we have. We have little dogs. Uh, R.C. had German shepherds. He didn't think our dogs were actually dogs. <laughs> Humuncio means little man. That's what it means. Not man, little man. It's a diminutive uh, suffix to the word. Do, do you see what the ancient... Um, instinct was of Augustine, God is great. It carried through the Middle Ages so that Anselm's instinct is that we are small. So we, little man, contemplate God. That's how he opens his philosophical treatise. It's an instinct, isn't it? And, and culturally, and where we sit in, in the uh, 2024, we sit in the opposite. Oh, we're surrounded by testimonies, uh, not to God's presence, but to our greatness. Uh, the things we've built, and the things we've conquered, and the things we've done. And all of these contribute to us thinking uh, entirely oppositely of how we should be thinking. Highly of ourselves and little of God. And I, I think we would be a little naive as Christians to think we're not susceptible to that from time to time. And here's the beauty of our vision of who God is and our understanding of who God is. No matter where you are, there's always room for growth. No matter how much we have grasped the holiness of God, there's always room to push into that mystery just a little further. No matter where we are in our devotion and obedience to a holy God, there's always room to push in and lean in to that obedience a little further. And in fact, it's when we begin to understand who God is that we realize that this is not a box we check, but this is a lifelong pursuit, a lifelong pursuit uh, to pursue God at the center of our lives and every aspect of our lives, like the, like the hub of a wheel that goes out to the spokes. That is why the holiness of God matters. I, uh, I'm going to risk something here for a few minutes. I'm going to risk an open Q&A session. So I... I, I think I alerted the powers to be, and there might be microphones. So if we have a roving microphone and a roving microphoner, and you have a question, now's the time. And if I can't answer it, uh, your pastor will. So it's, <laughs> so it's totally fine. He's used to it. So uh, we do have maybe seven minutes or so seven, eight minutes, would, would be glad to entertain a question or two that you might have from last evening, today. I heard a voice. There's a hand. I see that hand. D do you want to come forward? We'll sing just as I am. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Billy Graham country, right? I can do that? <laughs> yes. There's not a hand? It was a false convert, uh, conversion. <laughs> There's no, we don't have any questions. Over here. We might have one. Someone's going to bail me out here. All right. Uh, Dr. Ni Dr. Nichols, uh, many years ago, I attended a uh, Holiness of God conference and would love to know a little bit of the history on how those conferences began, um, maybe the genesis or the seed of, of how those uh, started. So the very first conference Ligonier did was in 1974 on the inerrancy of God, and, and um, about 400 people in attendance, and uh, they would do conferences. But it was 1988 
was the first what they called national conference. And it was held at the Altamont Springs Hilton Hotel. If, if you've ever been in Orlando and you've traveled the I-4, the I-4 interstate, uh, first of all, may God and his angels protect you. But secondly, uh, it's right along the I-4, and it was on loving a holy God. R.C. had written Holiness of God in 1985, Chosen by God in 1986, Pleasing God in, no, I'm sorry, One Holy Passion about loving God in 1986 or seven, and then 1988 released Pleasing God, a book that takes the doctrine of God and pushes it through sanctification. And so the culmination of all those books was taking this central idea of the holiness of God and carrying it through for application. And so the very first national conference uh, was 1988. Uh, Ligonier has been holding them ever since, and regional conferences. So every year in the spring, we hold our national conference uh, down in Orlando. Uh, we were talking last night that um, we, we try to have warm weather, but poor uh, Dr. DeYoung brings his whole family down uh, for it. This was back in 2016. Is that what we thought year it was? And um, just for him and his whole family to enjoy Central Florida, I think we had, what, 30-degree weather uh, for the entire time that he was down there. But, uh, yeah, we do our national conference. And, I mean, if you want to know what Ligonier does, basically we do three things. We broadcast, we publish, and we gather. Uh, we we uh, broadcast um, radio, podcasts, we publish books, articles, the Table Talk magazine, blog posts, and we gather together at conferences. And honestly, um, I think we need it as Christians. You know, we need that mutual encouragement um, as Christians. And then we gather specifically and in a very intense way uh, on the campus at uh, the place with Reformation Bible College. And I'll give a little plug. Amidst all those great books back there, uh, from what Westminster Books, where I used to work as a seminary student, I worked in the bookstore, um, is a little table with some Reformation Bible College stuff. So please take it, because I don't want to lug it back home in the suitcase. Got time for another question? Ah, right down front here. Is his, is his wife still living? Yes, Vesta's still alive. In fact, she's, uh, we were in California last week. Uh, we did an event. We did a, one of our youth events, Always Ready Youth Conference in, in California. She went to that. And then just this week, uh, Wednesday and Thurs Thursday and Friday, rather, we were in Dallas at uh, Park City's uh, Presbyterian Church. She was there for that. Uh, she's, you can't say a woman's age, but she's, she's an octogenarian. She's in the office Every day. Uh, she, she still edits. She edits all the table talks. So before they go out, she sees the copy. And uh, I run college stuff by her all the time. I, I usually see her every other day. I just like to stop in and see her. So I will go see her on Monday or on Tuesday when I get back and tell her about this. She, she's doing very well. Uh, she says, um, of course, she misses him, but uh, his Theology taught her that, of course, this is all in the sovereignty of God, and she just rests in that. So, yeah, she's alive. She's doing very well. Yeah, what was the genesis of the, the bold and sharp uh, Reformation Bible College? What was that process? Yeah, R.C., um, he says, I, I don't even have to close my eyes. I can see it. And he's talking about the Reformation Wall in Geneva. And just past the Reformation Wall, there's the city wall. And then that's where the Geneva Academy was, which has grown into the University of Geneva. But it was founded by Calvin. And uh, Calvin started a college, the Geneva Academy. And Luther was a pastor, but he was also a college professor at the University of Wittenberg. And what R.C. recognized was that the Reformers not only trained ministers, they established colleges. And he recognized the value of college. Uh, you know, sociologists say that between like two and six in college is when your ideas are really shaped. And um, he would say, 
I want their minds. I want their minds. And that was really uh, why he started Reformation Bible College and gave it the name. And uh, it, was, it was started in 2011. And, I, you know, I think also college was very formative on him personally. And I, I think that was part of it too. Yeah. There's one more question, and then I, I think we're, our time is up. So we have one more there. Making you run this morning. Yes, thank you for your time here. When I've listened to his podcasts and his teachings, I've always been surprised at his deep knowledge of the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. He yeah. would mention Rome, he would mention the yeah. theologies, the Pope, all this stuff, um, to a very, very deep level. And so the question is, at what point in his life did he start gaining all this knowledge and understanding of that? Because he talked about it quite a bit. So two things. One is, when he was in seminary, he had a, a basically a private class with John Gershner on the Council of Trent. And I, I have his book. It's got the Trent uh, in Latin and then an English translation. And there's a lot of underlining asterisks and, and there's also a lot of no. <laughs> so we're Trent. Trent was the Catholic, Roman Catholic response to the Reformation. And so he would big capital N, capital O, exclamation point, underlined, highlighted, asterisk, all through Council of Trent. Uh, so he did a line-by-line -line study. And then we even write in the margin, Gershner, and then he'll write something. And it was something Gershner was saying in the class. So he had a very thorough understanding. Then secondly, once he got to the Netherlands and studied under Burkhauer, Burkhauer had just come from Vatican II invited as the representative of the Dutch church. And on top of that, I don't know if you know this or not, Kevin, his roommate at Vatican II was Hans Kung, the, the Catholic theologian who actually was opposed to. So, so Burkhauer is literally fresh from Vatican II with Hans Kung's personal observations and commentary on what was happening at Vatican II. And when you think about it, those two, Trent and Vatican II, are really crucial. Uh, the other thing is Pittsburgh was full of Roman Catholic immigrants. And so it's a very Catholic uh, place, Pittsburgh, where R.C. grew up. So I think all of those things gave him both the firsthand experience of, of engaging with Roman Catholics and a really intense understanding of Roman Catholic doctrine, and all that culminated in his discussions of uh, Roman Catholicism. And my time is up, and thank you very much. Stay up for just a second. Uh, two quick questions. Just thinking of that, did R.C. have any contact with Scott Hahn over the years? One of the yeah. famous, you know, Presbyterian, yep. yeah, what, who then became a, a Catholic apologist. Yeah, more uh, indirectly, and, and, uh, but I do think this is, it's hard to criticize R.C. because I do think he's very fair. So it was more, it, it wasn't more of a criticism of R.C. from Scott Hahn, but yeah. you know, he would try to reach out to R.C. quite often. I bet. Yeah. 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 Uh, last question, which some of uh, our, our folks here, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, how is Kim Westbrook and Neil <laughs> yes. and the girls doing? Yes. I saw Kim just before I came. I said, Kim, I'm, I'm on my way. Uh, she, of course, uh, misses you, misses you all. She, she told me she remembers when you started Faithful, yeah, yeah. and uh, she was right there. So Kim yeah. was, my, was Mike's assistant, and then mine, yeah. and then something better down in Florida. So she well, is, now uh, she's Chris Larson's she's Chris executive Larson's, assistant she's, in Ligonier. Yeah, yeah. She's, it's wonderful to have Great. Kim and Neil. And uh, Neil, when he's not working at Ligonier, has his Jeep on the beach, and he's surfing. So I'm, he's I'm a very sure happy man uh, in Central Florida. So yeah, we love having the West Coast. So I'm sure they would, lost they, would, our game. they would invite all of us to come and stay with them and go to the beach. I think just they have gonna, a guest yeah, house. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah for, sure, sure, for sure. Pretty sure has a guest house. Yeah, go uh, call, call them. All down, right, thank you. Go yeah. uh, check out uh, the books, and of course we'll be back in worship at 1045.